We turn now to James Toronto, our best of the web columnist, who's uh, talking to us via Skype. How are you doing, James? Hey, pretty well, Dan. How are you? Good. Uh, I want to chat with you a little bit about uh, an interview that former uh, acting Solicitor General Neil Kital gave uh, to Agence France Press uh, today. It was about the health care law before the Supreme Court, and he was trying to defend it. Let me just read to you one of the answers he gave to the press agency. Mr. Kital said, if the Supreme Court strikes this down, I think that it would not be just about health care. It would be the Supreme Court saying, look, we've got the power to really take decisions, move them off the table of the American people, even in a democracy. And so, he said, it would imperil a number of reforms in the New Deal that are designed to help people against big governments and against, indeed, big corporations. Could you deconstruct that uh, answer a little bit for us, James? Well, apparently they no longer teach Marbury versus Madison in law school. I mean, uh, the whole uh, basis of American constitutional law since 1803 has been that the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review, the power to take laws passed by Congress and determine whether they uh, are in, uh, in uh, are consistent with the Constitution. So this is a uh, an uncontroversial power that the court is exercising now. Does it turn back the New Deal? No, it doesn't, because uh, as Paul mentioned in the last segment, uh, this raises a novel question. It's not necessary for the justices to uh, go back and reconsider old precedents, because the question here is, can Congress force individuals to buy something? Does the Commerce Clause uh, give Congress that power over individuals uh, who might otherwise not be in the marketplace? That question has never been raised before because no law purporting to do this has ever been passed before. Yeah. Let me read you one other thing that Mr. Ketal said. The challengers to the reform say that never before has the government forced people to buy a product. And so, Mr. Ketal, we are not forcing people to buy a product. It seems as though it's getting a little abstruse, James, but the fact is it is very important to make a distinction here about whether or not this is a product or whether this is a personal decision. Well, what Kachal is, uh, the distinction he's making is between a product and a financial instrument. So the product, which is a term he's actually using as something of a metaphor because most of what you buy in healthcare is services, not products. But on the one side you have the product, on the other side you have the insurance policy, which is a financial instrument. So he's saying, well, the Commerce Clause gives, you, gives Congress the power to mandate the purchase of a financial instrument, just not a product. This is something of a concession because it, uh, it's a way of getting around the question, could the government force you to buy broccoli? But it's actually a concession that goes right to the heart of the New Deal jurisprudence. Because in a 1944 case, when the court said that Congress has the power to regulate insurance, it did away with that distinction. Commerce was originally understood to mean trade in goods, in products. As, as, uh, as one understands them. Under the New Deal jurisprudence, there is no distinction between products and uh, financial instruments. So if the court uh, recognizes Kachal's reasoning here, uh, there goes the New Deal. Well, take up Paul's point. I mean, there is an argument made by people who are holding Mr. Kachal's position that it is simply not a big leap from the New Deal jurisprudence on the Commerce Clause <clears throat> to what they're trying to achieve with this law. And I guess your argument would be it is an enormous leap. Well, how big a leap it is depends on uh, whether you believe to begin with that the Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to do, as the New York Times' as Linda Greenhouse puts it, basically whatever it wants. Uh, if you believe that we have a government of limited and enumerated powers, then it's a huge leap. Uh, now, it's a leap that uh, a lot of people would like to take, and the court has taken big leaps before. So it's possible that the court will take this leap. But let's look before we leap. Let's acknowledge what a big leap it is. Well, I guess as far as I'm concerned, if perchance the court finds that the mandate is unconstitutional, it will be, to everyone's surprise, a big leap in the reverse direction that I don't think too many people were expecting, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't shock me at all if they decided just not to go where the administration wants to take them. I take it you're going down there tomorrow, James. Uh, I'm going to be there Wednesday. I'm uh, attending the severability hearing. This is the hearing on the question of whether if Obamacare's individual mandate is unconstitutional, the whole law or other parts of the law have to fall. I'm kind of, I'm so much up to speed on the Commerce Clause question, I thought the, uh, uh, the severability one would be more interesting to watch. All right, we'll try to get you back to talk about that. Thanks a lot, James. Talk Thanks. to you later.